Welcome back APGov students. Today is chapter 7 of Keeping the Republic titled Congress. If you don't have Keeping the Republic, it's fine because the content is still going to be the same. I'm going to be going over all the key terms and notes for this chapter that helped me get a 5, so I encourage you to take notes along as well. Constituencies, the group of people represented by an elected official. These people influence how an elected official acts once they are in office. So the group that a politician will pay attention the most is their constituency. So Congress people are very responsive to people in their area. People in their area can send them letters and things like that, and they're usually very uh, responsive to them because they want to keep popularity within their constituency. Policy representation, advancing the will of the voter through policy. Doing this ensures that a politician's constituency remains happy by fulfilling what the voters have asked. So the politician elected into Congress has sort of a responsibility to reflect the will of their constituency through the bills that they sign off on or the bills that they try and implement through uh, legislation. Allocator representation, getting funding for constituent localities. This ensures that the surrounding geographic region of a politician's constituency receives funding for major projects done by the local and state governments. A lot of local politics and state politics is about getting people that represent them in higher levels of government to get funding for their states, funding for their districts, things like that, and that's what allocated representation kind of is. Symbolic representation, identifying with American values, it specifically pertains to the apolitical sphere trying to connect with people on a more personal and valuable level. So politicians, members of the media, and people just in general positions of power try and connect with people beyond just their pure political ideology and their political beliefs. They try and identify with their core American values, and that and oftentimes can be more powerful and influential than just identifying in certain policy areas. Hyperpartisanship, deep differences among people of different political parties. This greatly affects the effectiveness of government, specifically the legislative branch, by preventing compromise from happening. So that's specifically what we can observe now in America, that the two sides of the political aisle are becoming very hyperly divided, and this prevents any sort of compromise because they view the other side not as like a political bargaining person but just as an enemy and that is not healthy for trying to pass legislation when two sides cannot come together. Bicameral legislature, two houses of congress, just the house and the senate. The different houses of government represent the will of the people in different ways as well as represent different structural values. One of the themes reflected in AP Gov ought is that the house represents the common man and a greater percentage of people and represents you know the passion for politics because it's a large body that's very argumentative at times and it's very quick moving and the senate is more of an elitist body because there's less people so it's harder to be elected to senate so you have you know higher power people getting those positions in senate and the senate's a slower moving body it's not as chaotic as the house so the house and the senate represent two different sides of politics one being the energetic and chaotic side one being the elitist and slow moving side congressional oversight oversight over the executive branch this allows congress to watch over both the president and the bureaucracy to ensure that the laws are being executed faithfully one piece of congressional oversight that really gets its way into the media and the public eye is when Congress will hold hearings and people from big corporations, people from the bureaucracy, people from just higher positions in the executive branch will stand trial in front of Congress to answer questions on certain activities and many times certain failures. This is a checking power that the legislative branch has against the executive. Advice and consent, court appointees must be made with consideration by the Senate. This serves as a major checking power for the legislature directly against the executive branch, but also indirectly against the judicial branch. So it, for the Supreme Court, for example, Supreme Court justices nominated by the president, nominated by the executive branch, have to get voted on and approved by the Senate before they can take office. Reapportionment, reallocating House seats based on the U.S. Census. Every 10 years, the balance of state influence in the House can change. So if states' population changes, some states might gain more seats while other states might have less seats. And this just has to do with populations moving as time goes on. Redistricting, redrawing district lines for House seats in states. This process determines what areas are represented together for House elections. So within each state, the state legislatures are allowed to draw lines on where each district should be because in the House, there's many different districts in each state that has a representative. And this happens following that every 10 years thing where if the number of representatives change, they have to redraw the district lines. Or they might just redraw it anyway, even if they have the same lines, because populations move within the states just like they move between states. It's kind of a weird process, but this basically just defines what areas inside the state vote together and are represented by the same House representative. 
Gerrymandering, unfairly drawing districts to benefit one group. This is more of a malicious type of redistricting. It allows for discrimination to be done behind closed doors, often giving specific political parties or racial groups advantages. So since the, since the state legislatures are doing or play a large part in redistricting, if it's dominated by one political party or dominated by one race, they might draw the district lines in a way that really hurts uh, certain groups. So they might put three localities that are heavy Republican with three with one town that's heavy Democrat or vice versa. And that basically makes so that they separate all the Democrat or Republican groups into areas where they know they can't have a high influence. They know they can't win elections. And that the same thing is done with racial gerrymandering where they might put all the black localities together and that basically only gives them one representative while all the white localities get all the other representatives. And some of the maps are crazy. Look at Supreme Court cases. I believe they're required like Shaw v. Reno. There's some pretty crazy district lines drawn to do gerrymandering. Speaker of the House, elected leader of the House. They have immense power over what bills get heard on the House floor. The Speaker of the House has a lot of powers. You don't need to know a lot of them, but just know the Speaker plays a very large role in how bills are passed, how bills are debated, what bills even make the floor to get voted on. And the Speaker of the House has a lot more power than the majority leader in the Senate. Seniority system, leaders hold advanced power. Leaders in all spaces, whether committee leaders or the speaker themselves, hold more power in all house functions. So the house has much more of a reliance on leadership in comparison to the Senate, partly because the house is just a very large body, so you have to have clearly defined leaders. So leaders of committees, leaders of certain caucuses, whatever, they hold a lot of influence over what the members can do, and they really push people to do certain things. Standing committees, permanent committees, these committees are usually very important and have more resources because they are always going on, they're always standing. They have a lot of resources, they're able to consolidate a lot of the resources from the budget because if they're always because if they're always in session then they're always gonna be able to capture the budget when the budget passes every year. And they're usually very important because if they're still standing committees then whatever issue they're on is probably important. House Rules Committee determines how and when bills are debated. Exclusive to the House, it sets the guidelines for how certain bills are discussed on the House floor and also notes who is even allowed to speak. Because there are 435 members of the House, you can't have everyone debate on a bill. You can't have everyone get their voices heard or have unlimited time to speak on a bill. So the House Rules Committee plays a key role in organizing how bills are passed just to keep the House moving, to keep efficiency up in a body that's so large. Select committees, temporary committees, they are only intended to do specific things at specific moments. These committees can be very reactionary or they're just on a scheduled basis where like things need to be done at certain times of the year. Joint committees, committees consisting of people from the House and the Senate. These committees have access to more people and resources within Congress because they branch between each House. Because they branch between each House of Congress, they can access a lot more people and they also have the two aspects of Congress working for them. You have the elitist Senate people who a lot of times have more outreach and then you have people in the house who have access to a very energetic base and then these committees can do a lot of different things and be very effective. Conference committees, temporary committees consisting of people from the house and the senate. These committees are intended for specific moments and are often important. If they need to group people from all, you know, both houses of congress to get a large body of thinkers on a specific thing, it's usually because the moment or the, the, react, the thing they're reacting to that they need to make a committee for is pretty important. Legislative agenda defines what issues are important to Congress. These agendas often have partisan backings and reflect the will of the majority. They target what the public wants and capitalize on specific trending issues. The legislative agenda is set by the majority party. The legislative agenda is more powerful if the same party holds a you know, majority in both the House and the Senate. And they often reflect like the presidential agenda and the party agendas. Filibuster, rule in the Senate that delays voting. Senators can essentially talk for an eternity if they want to in order for a bill to never be voted on. There are a lot of weird stories about the filibuster rule where senators will just blabber on the stage or they'll like read a book or something if they don't want certain bills to get passed because there is a rule that in the Senate everyone can speak if they want to. So someone could just keep talking and talking and talking and never vote on a bill. And there are a lot of games within the Senate around the filibuster. It's not, it's not seemingly as like in a weird term overpowered as it seems to be. It doesn't happen too too often. Sometimes the senators will come to compromises just so they can avoid the minority party from filibustering. And there are ways to break the filibuster. Cloture, this is the way to break the filibuster. 
vote in the Senate to break a filibuster. This can only be done by achieving 60 votes, which can be hard in times of partisanship and polarization. So 60 votes, which is like a three-fifths majority, is enough to break the filibuster to stop the minority party or the opposing party of the bill to just keep talking and talking and talking. That's called invoking cloture. This is very hard to do when the Senate is very close in the numbers. So the filibuster is incredibly powerful when there's more partisanship, more polarization, and uh, hotly contested Senate. Omnibus legislation, combination of multiple bills in one vote. This is often done with difficult bills by lumping in the controversial bits with the essential items. So this will take bills that are more popular or bills that are centered on issues that are more popular and they'll, a party will take some part of their agenda that is less popular and they'll lump it in. That's a lot of the talking points you hear now where bills that are getting passed through Congress have certain titles and certain names that mean you know good things but then individual members of Congress will try and lump in bills that aren't as important and opposing sides will be like, ah, we actually don't want that. We don't oppose the whole bill, but we don't want these specific parts. And that's what starts to delay bills from getting passed in Congress when people are nitpicking certain things they want out and when people are trying to sneak things in. Veto override, Congress's ability to overrule an executive veto. This can be done by a two-thirds vote in Congress to overrule a presidential veto. This is more powerful when the president is in a different party than the majority party in Congress. Pocket veto, indirect veto by a president. This can be done by the president delaying signing a bill for 10 days. If the congressional session runs out during that time, the bill is not passed. This is a really weird term because it shows up, in my opinion, way too much on certain like AP Gov tests when it's literally just a weird term called the pocket veto. It's not like an essential thing the president has. But basically what it is, is that if Congress is taking too long in their congressional session to pass a bill, if the president just doesn't sign a bill and the congressional session ends and they all go on vacation, then the bill just isn't passed and it's just lost to the ether. And that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next chapter and goodbye. Yo, if you're super cool and awesome, you should follow my Twitter or X if you're that kind of person. It's at Clark4724. I post a lot of random stuff on there, but I also post channel updates and when my next videos are coming out. So if you're gonna keep watching my channel, then I recommend you follow and thanks.